this is going to be another question and answer video and if i haven't uh, done your answer yet it's just because um it's we went through the holidays and stuff and i had a lot of work going on so don't think that i forgot about you it's just it's taken me a little bit longer because the past couple weeks have been really busy but this question has to do with how should we treat lost people this was a good question. How should we treat lost people? Should we be around them? Should we be good to them, mistreat them? And then another question that was from another person, but will go along with it, is how should we deal with rejection from lost people or religious people? And um, I'll answer that one at the end. But the first, how should we treat lost people? We need to walk right and talk right. This is a big thing. If you're going to tell everybody at work that you're a Christian and tell everybody at school that you're a Christian, you have opened up a big can of worms. You have a huge responsibility. In Colossians 4, 5, and 6, it says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Them that are without are the lost people of this world. And you need to be very conscious of how you walk around lost men and how you talk around lost men. Let your speech be with grace. A lost man doesn't have the Holy Spirit like you do. He doesn't have the comfort of the Scriptures like you do. He can't understand the Scriptures like you do. You need to be aware and understanding of these things. You're going to have to understand that. For example, I'm not the type of person to tell a lost man to quit cussing or to quit drinking or to quit doing any bad thing that he's doing. All that matters for him is that he gets saved and until then, everything else doesn't really matter so much because, you know, he's probably not even going to be able to quit those things until he does get saved. And quitting those things is not what's going to save him. What's going to save him is, you know, you give him the gospel and he believes it and then you can work on helping him clean his life up. But I just don't see the sense in going up to a lost person and telling him to quit drinking, quit cussing, quit smoking. You see what I mean? He's going to have to get saved first. I mean, a lost person can turn over a new leaf, but there's nothing like getting saved and then starting to live right. And I talk to lost people about the gospel. I tell them about the death, burial, and resurrection. I don't waste time telling them to quit certain sins. Now, you're going to have to realize that they are going to cuss. They're going to tell dirty jokes and do what lost people do. Let your speech be all, always be with grace, seasoned with salt. So... Even though your speech is with grace, at the same time, lost people need the truth, and that is the salt. The truth hurts. Don't ever compromise on the truth to get along with them. Don't ever compromise the gospel to get along with them. Don't expect them to act like a safe person, but at the same time, don't let them cause you to act like a lost person. They may talk about their drinking and things like that, but this doesn't mean you have to act like that's okay. You can show complete disagreement. For example, if they talk to me about drinking and ask me why I don't drink, I show them with the Bible why it is a sin to drink. But the difference is I don't go just go up to them and tell them to quit drinking because it's a sin. Because our main concern for them is getting them saved, not cleaning up their life before they're saved. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12 says, And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. So it says to study to be quiet and to do your own business. It said to walk honestly toward them that are without. That's the lost people. Someone who isn't a big mouth, they have studied to be quiet and they work with their own hands, they're going to get respect from those who are without. When you come and give an honest day's work, when I'm at work, I'm quiet for the most part, 
and I work. I don't complain. I give an honest day's work in front of them that are without. And this makes for a good testimony. If they see a saved guy who works hard and keeps his mouth shut, he earns their respect. Don't have a holier-than-thou attitude. You're no better than they are. The only reason you're going to heaven and they're not going to heaven is because you have believed the gospel and they have not believed the gospel. You have the same flesh as they do. Your flesh is capable of the same sins that they're talking about committing every day. Another thing is lost people appreciate a sense of humor. Now it's tricky to have a sense of humor around lost people because if you tell a joke, then they start with their dirty jokes. So be warned of that. You just have to say clean jokes only, please. Then they get the idea. They get the, you know, you don't want to hear the dirty jokes. You can't go along with everything they say and do because they, they're they expecting you to be different. And God expects you to be different. If the lost people doesn't see you being different, then you're not doing any good. In Titus 2.14, it says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Zealous of good works. You're supposed to be a peculiar people. You're going to stick out in a crowd. Everyone will be cussing in the break room and you'll be reading your Bible. When they say a dirty joke, you shouldn't laugh. And there are going to be times when the dirty jokes are funny because your flesh likes to laugh at dirty jokes. You have to fight the flesh. You're going to have to quit cussing. If you're a Christian and you got a cussing mouth, that's disgusting. A Christian cussing is a true testimony killer. I've seen this over and over again. A Christian cussing, they have ruined their testimony at work. The lost people have no respect for them whatsoever. Uh, it's a testimony killer. A guy I work with has earned the nickname of the cussing deacon. His testimony with them is destroyed. I mean, there's a chance, you know, he could come back and say he shouldn't have been doing that, start living right, and over a period of time maybe earn their respect back in that way. But for now, he's the cussing deacon. You don't want to be the cussing deacon. A preacher I work with followed a young girl around trying to get with her for like a year at work. And all the guys at work talk about the preacher man trying to get some. That's what they always used to say, the preacher man's trying to get some. They expect him to be different, you see. They all flirt with her, but they expect a married, a married preacher to act better than they do. And he ought to. I expect a married pastor to act better than a lost fornicator. Uh, when a Christian acts like this, it gives them gives the lost people an opportunity to blaspheme God and to talk bad about the Bible and to talk bad about Christians in general, just like David's sin in 2 Samuel 12, 13, and 14. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because this deed thou hast given great occasion, occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. David took Bathsheba, had Uriah murdered. This gave occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. So you want to try to live as clean and right as you can in front of lost people. The way I approach lost people is I treat them with respect. I don't try to make them act like a saved person. Because they're not a safe person. They're a lost person. I give them the gospel. And I don't just act act saved in front of them. Because you see, a lot of people tell you, you know, I don't have to witness. I just live like a safe person in front of people. That's the only part of it. You want definitely want to act saved in front of them. But you give them the gospel as well. You have those who give the gospel and then laugh at the dirty jokes of the lost people and participate in their sinful lifestyle. For example, much of the uh, contemporary modern uh, Christianity is they give the gospel, they try to spread the word of God, but at the same time, 
They wear the same clothes. They walk the same. They talk the same. They listen to the same music. They try to be cool. A lot of the um, pastors, they dress up like a like a, a metrosexual or something to try to uh, get the young people to like them, get the world to like them. At the same time, they're trying to give out the gospel, and it just it doesn't make any sense. They're trying to act like the world and trying to give the gospel at the same time. You don't want to do that. That's not balanced. But then you have men who live right in front of lost people, but they never give the gospel or give them the word of God, and then this is imbalanced. So you give the gospel and live right in front of the people. You need to have a sense of humor. You, that's real. That's big. You need to have a sense of humor. You don't want to be just hateful and mean all the time. I believe also there are times to be quiet. Don't just always remain silent. You know, the devil wants you to keep your mouth shut. So don't always remain silent. You have to learn that when, when it's a time to speak and a time to shut up. But it's good to keep your mouth shut many times. And it's good to work hard on the job. Be a man, be tough, gain respect from the men at work. And now I don't believe in hanging around lost men. For, for example, making them your best friends. They will rub off on you. Nothing wrong with taking them out for lunch in an effort to give them the gospel and things like that. But don't go around making them your best friend and going to the club with them and going dancing with them. Because then you're just acting like them. And they need someone to help them who doesn't act just like them. It's the same thing for safe people who act lost. You shouldn't hang out with safe people who act like lost people. Because it rubs off on you. It's a little different when you approach a safe person who acts like a lost person. Because you're not approaching them to get them saved. Because they've told you they're already saved. You need to give them a wake up call. A subtle way to do that is living right in front of them. This puts a Christian under conviction fast. When they tell a dirty joke and then ask you why you're not laughing, you can say, well, I'm a Christian and I'm trying to live right. This will get them thinking because they'll be like, well, I'm a Christian. Why am I laughing at it? You see, the, you approach them different. When you approach a lost person, you're not trying to get him to act saved. When you approach a Christian who acts lost, you know, you need to be given some hints that he needs to do better in front of people. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Notice when he says not to company with fornicators, he says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. If you were to quit hanging around people, fornicators, altogether, you'd have to leave the world. That's why he says, For then must need ye go out of the world. But the Lord knows you have to work with lost people. You will have to rub shoulders with fornicators and idolaters and backslid Christians. But the thing is, you don't want to just make them your best friend, who you hang out with, who you call, who you continuously hang out with now first corinthians 5 11 through 13 but now i have written unto you not to keep company if a man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner which such in one know not to eat for what have i to do to judge them also that are without do not ye judge them that are within but them that are without god judgeth therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So it is up to us to not hang around backslid Christians and to not company with the backslid Christians because they're acting like the world and that will rub off on you. I believe it's a tragedy for a safe person to act like a lost person in front of lost people. It's a tragedy. There is another guy I work with who is a preacher. They even call him preacher. And he says all these four-letter words in every sentence. It ruins his testimony. When he walks out of that break room, they laugh at him. They say, you know, how are you going to be a preacher and cuss like that? There's another guy that claimed to be a preacher, a big Christian, and he drank. The lost people was like, how are you going to say you're a preacher and then drink? You know, if a lot of that, that's what gave me 
a, a really good answer to, you know, uh, when people see you reading your Bible, they start asking you questions. One of the most commonly asked questions is, um, is it a sin to drink alcohol? And one, the first things I'll say before I even give them any scripture is, if you see me in here reading my Bible today, and then tomorrow you see me at a bar drinking, what are you going to say about me? You're going to say I'm a hypocrite. That right there shows you that they know it's a sin. Because why would they call me a hypocrite for drinking one day and reading my Bible the next day? That shows you deep down everybody knows it's wrong to drink. And if you're claiming to be a Christian and you're just social drinking, you're ruining your testimony. I know Christians who put pictures of themselves drinking alcohol on Instagram and Facebook. That is disturbing and disgusting. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Struggling with the sin of drinking is one thing. I can understand that. Somebody who was an alcoholic before they were saved, they're struggling with the sin of drinking after salvation. But someone who claims to be saved and they're drinking alcohol and putting, it, putting pictures of it on Facebook and Instagram with no shame, that's taking it to, that's another step. You're much more far gone than the alcoholic who's struggling with getting victory over it. So you're going to kill your testimony. And it makes the lost people be more skeptical, skeptical of me because they think I'm going to be a huge hypocrite just like all the other Christians. Now, all of us are hypocrites to a certain extent even if it's just a little bit, but even a lost person can see a difference between someone who is trying to live right, someone who's trying to live like a Christian, and someone who claims to be a Christian, but they're a jerk and they're living just like they are. And if you accidentally do something wrong in front of a lost person, you really need to apologize. If you say a cuss word out of anger, just apologize and say you don't talk that way and you just let the job get the best of you. And you could even use this as an opportunity to explain to him how nobody is perfect even after salvation. Now that next question, another question is, is it normal to experience rejection and be made fun of by lost or religious people? So I believe this is extremely normal, and the Bible says that it would happen much more so by lost religious people and not by your average lost person, in my experience. In my experience, a lost religious person is many times much more mean and wicked toward your uh, Bible-believing Christianity than the average lost man. The average lost man might snigger at you or something, but he just he doesn't look at you in disgust, usually, for reading the Bible or something, usually. But in 1 John 3.13, it says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. And John 15, 18 and 19, it says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Many people think you're crazy for not drinking and because you don't do drugs and because you don't fornicate and because you don't watch certain movies and TV shows. It is the will of God for the world to to think that you're strange. In 1 Peter 4, 2 through 4, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of right speaking evil of you. You see, they think it's strange that you don't do it. John 15, 19, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Religious people can't stand a Bible believer just like they could not stand Jesus Christ. Look what happens in John 5, 16. And therefore, the Jew, therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. See, they were worried about the Sabbath. They were religious, but at the same time, they were seeking to slay Jesus Christ. 
I get the most resistance from religious people. You know, some examples, uh, a holiness woman made fun of my bumper stickers and car magnets with Bible verses on it. This, you know, different things like this have happened mostly by religious people where they make fun of how I'm living or my Bible, things like that. Religious people are the ones that down me for being a King James man. Uh, a religious woman said my gospel tracts were silly. Another religious woman asked me how many Bibles do I need and looked at me with disgust because I have so many Bibles. And this is coming from someone with millions of purses. If you can collect all these purses, uh, what's wrong with me having half as many Bibles as you got purses? I mean, come on. Uh, isn't it strange that people think it's silly to buy a nice Bible, but they'll buy a nice gun, they'll buy a nice, you know, a lot of times people say, how much was that Bible? Because, you know, it's nice. I got nice Bibles. And I'm like, $70. And they're like, $70 for a Bible? Well, yeah, you just spent $300 on a purse. You just spent so much money on a gun. You just spent so much money on a DVD, a Blu-ray DVD or whatever it is now that people watch movies on. Isn't it strange that they got something wrong with you buying a nice expensive Bible or having a Bible collection? What's it to them? See, that's somebody who is under conviction because they never read the Bible. Bibles are meant to be used. All the Bibles I buy, I use. And the average religious churchgoer has one Bible that they've had for 40 years, and that's good. But some of the pages look brand new because they never touch it. Religious people can't stand the Bible. They can't stand Bible believers. Religious people are many times devil-possessed and they're jealous because they see you living a holy life that they claim to live. They profess, they profess that their works have a part in their salvation, and yet they really don't have any good works. They may not do be doing many bad things, but they're not doing any good things. But yet they say their works play a part in their salvation. Yet they really don't have any good works. And then they see a Bible believer who doesn't believe works play a part in his salvation. And yet that Bible believer who doesn't believe works play a part in his salvation has more good works than the religious guy who does believe works play a part in his salvation. And the Bible believer has a way higher standard of holy living. For example, the average Bible-believing pastor who doesn't believe works play a part in salvation, he believes eternal security. Uh, his standards of holiness are way above the average religious person, way above their standards of holiness, even though that religious person is relying on their works to get them into heaven. And this is what makes the religious people hate the Bible believer. This is what will make a Catholic, a holiness person, a Church of Christ person. That's what makes them hate a Bible believer because they profess they are living holy and they're getting to heaven by their own holiness. Yet they see the Bible believer who believes he's going to heaven by grace through faith and he believes once saved, always saved, and they see him, and he has a much higher standard of holiness. They see him reading his Bible when they don't. They see him witnessing when they don't. This makes them hate the Bible believer, and it makes them jealous, and it makes them envy him. This causes the religious people to hate them. In Matthew twenty-seven seventeen through 18, it says, Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said, and said unto them, whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas, or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. So just like they hated Jesus, they persecuted Jesus, they envied Jesus, they sought to kill Jesus. They hated everything he said. If you act like Jesus, then you're going to see the same thing from lost people, specifically lost religious people. So that's been a, the question on how should we treat lost people 
and is uh, rejection from the world a normal thing? 